Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Today is the 3rd of June, 2020. And we are having a panel discussion on standards for knowledge graphs. This is our second session and uh, of this kind. And I'm gonna go over briefly See if this is going to work. Screen. Okay, there's the. Um, this this session was organized by Ram Sriram. Uh, but he cannot make it today. Um, so I'm just going to go through his slides. These are mostly from his, uh, the first session. So the first thing about knowledge graphs is that there's sort of generic modeling requirements. Uh, this is not particularly unique to knowledge graphs. So we would expect all of these features in a um, in any standard that would be concerned with knowledge graphs, but um, during our series uh, ontology summit series this year, we had many marvelous talks and sessions, and one of the things that has been emerging from not only this, but other meetings is that the field seems to be reasonably mature, particularly with regard to what's happening in industry. This suggests that standards would certainly be appropriate at this point. So Ram suggested these four questions that uh, I hope each of the panelists can address to some degree. Are we ready for standards? I hope that's true. Now, what is the current state of the art? Uh, can you look a bit into the future and see what you might expect that's going, going to happen then? And what are the roles for various organizations, academics, industry, standards, bodies, government? So today we have a panel consisting of uh, three eminent uh, individuals who have been very active in the standards area. Uh, Lisa Carnahan from NIST is going to talk about the uh, standards process. Um, then Barry Smith from the University of Buffalo. Um, he will, um, I'm sure he'll have a lot of insights about standards. And then Michael Gruninger, who's been very active in ISO standards, will talk about standards and technology and ontologies. So Lisa Can you try sharing your screen? Uh, sure. You, I, hmm. Did I send those to you? Yes, you did. Do you want me to do that? Um, well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> I, I have them too. It's just up to you. All right, let me, uh, let me do this. Uh, share screen. Oh, well, you might as well. You've disabled sharing screen. It says host has disabled sharing screen. I'm going to, give me a second. I will okay. enable this. You should be able to do it now. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. A little new to me. Yes, we have it. You have it? Is that better? That's great. Okay. Well, yay. Um, so, um, Ken mentioned, I'm Lisa Carnahan. I'm in the Information Technology Laboratory 
Um, I actually worked for Rom for a bit um, before I moved to a different position. Um, Rom sends his regrets. He's actually receiving a fellowship as we speak from the small, solid, uh, solid Mod Modeling Association. So kudos to him. Um, so we've got those four questions. Um, a little bit of a caveat. Um, I am. I have a lot of standards experience. I don't have ontology experience, and I'm not an ontology expert. So um, forgive me for any missteps that I make in, in the nomenclature of ontologies. Um, you can just go ahead and correct me <laughs> um, in that. So um, standards do matter. And so we had uh, the, the, I had three questions. You had four questions, Ken. Um, why do we need standards? I think this indicates why we need standards at, at, at some level. Um, in the state of the art and, and what should organizations be doing. So what I thought today, um, I talk a little bit about um, how ITL views standards and the importance we have on them, um, the view a little bit of, of ontologies and knowledge graphs in the standard space, um, and, then, and then some general thoughts about standardization itself as, as these um, as knowledge graph standards go forward. So I want to give you a, just a brief introduction about ITL. I'm, I'm, I assume most of you know about the Information Technology Lab at NIST. It's one of five uh, laboratory programs at NIST. Um, ROM is a division chief in one of those programs. Um, and you can see our mission. We're all about measurement science and standards. Um, but in ITL specifically, um, we like to think about using those to actually cultivate trust in IT. Right, so that um, through measurement and standards and, and testing, test method development, um, we have confidence in, in, the, in the tools we're using, the software we're using, the information technology we're using. And that kind of forms the basis of a lot of our decision making in terms of um, what roles we take in given areas with respect to measurement or standards or test method development. So I always like to start, um, because I'm a standard person, I like to start with the definition of a standard that, that at least NIST embraces. And it's, um, it, it's a document, and we're talking about um, of documentary standards here, although um, a lot of, um, in the IT spec space, we're seeing those move into different types of artifacts than documents. But certainly established by consensus, um, it leads to common repeated use. Um, and rules and guidelines about the characteristics of whatever it is, um, and aimed at the achievement of the optimum degree of order. So we like to read that as it does what it's supposed to do. Um, and so we're, we're in that space. Um, standards are very essential to ITL. Um, ROM um, operates a whole division whose, whose focus is on research, but ultimately leading to some form of standardization. In the Information Technology Laboratory, uh, we have about 400 people in the laboratory overall. We have about 95 people participating across 100 different standards groups. Um, typically, we don't set out to write a standard for standards sake. We have a defined goal or an impact, um, and that standards are a means to achieve that goal or impact. And I think as you guys go forward talking about standards, standards development for knowledge graphs, ontologies, things like that, it's not about just having the document, it's what the impact or the goal is, what do you want that document to do. Um, we have um, played many, many different roles in standards um, all across ITL, um, and we have different roles. Um, sometimes we lean in, lean in pretty heavy in an SDO. Um, we took one of our standards for cryptography, um, for cryptographic modules into ISO. Um, we took on the editor editorship role there. We leaned in heavy, a lot of resources. Um, to, to make that happen. Sometimes um, we are observers in, S, in standards activities. For example, um, there's a lot of standards activities going on around um, ethical and societal concerns in artificial intelligence. We're observing those. Um, we're primarily computer scientists and engineers, so um, it's not quite our swim lane, but we want to know what's going on there. Sometimes we have to take a little bit of a defensive approach. Um, is, you all in, in the IT field know sometimes standardization happens perhaps a little too early um, in a process and sometimes you have to get involved to make sure stupid stuff doesn't happen um, because those standards efforts started too early. Some of the roles we play, um, often we are experts in, um, in, in standards efforts, um, technical experts. Um, we'll play in leadership roles. NIST enjoys a, a very nice reputation as a, as a neutral body 
Um, and so we can often take leadership roles. People have confidence in us um, in being fair. Um, we'll be an editor. Power of the pen is very important. Um, and sometimes we're an influencer. So sometimes we are outside of the SDO talking to other organizations to see um, where best to put resources and to, um, and, and to sort of steer work to happen. Um, I would imagine that Rom um, would play that role very nicely in this, in this regard. Um, we actually reward our standards efforts. We have some missed awards and some ITL rewards for significant standards, so we do think they're important. Um, a quick thing about the purposes of standards, we kind of lump them into four, uh, four purposes. You may, uh, you may see, them, see it differently, that's okay, there's no wrong answer. Um, we see standards for uh, commercial communication. I like to describe it as um, it's a communication between a buyer and a seller. Um, so we all know what we mean. And certainly in your space with uh, knowledge graphs and ontologies and things like that, um, uh, oh my gosh, if we had that before we started a lot of standards developments, writing standards in natural language, even this communication would be better. Yeah, remove a lot of ambiguity. Um, standards also support the public welfare for building codes and healthcare and safety and things like that. Um, in, in manufacturing, um, NIST has a, a heavy emphasis on manufacturing. There's a lot of standards for management systems, for uniform processes in manufacturing and supply chain. I also think that's an area um, that would benefit from, um, from the work that you all want to do or going to go forward with standardization. And then the big bucket of compatibility, and that's compatibility in plumbing and electricity and all kinds of building things and healthcare. Um, the whole IT surface um, is really about, in standards, um, is a lot about compatibility. There's very few IT um, products made that, that generally aren't intended to be con connected anywhere for anything or exchange information with anything else. Um, that's another area I think where you all can, can um, help out significantly. Um, I see across the board in, in standards areas where um, there's compatibility, we think, until we realize we have differing semantics um, and, and different concepts. Um, and I think that's where you guys can, can play a lead role in that as well. So on ontologies, knowledge graphs, and standards, um, I, was, I broke this down a little bit. I had a little bit of discussion with Ron, but I broke it down into um, standards for um, the development of ontologies, knowledge graphs um, to begin with. And I think that um, that work would certainly be key. I know there's a, a lot of tools out there um, already, um, but uh, as someone who doesn't do ontology standards but did a lot in the standard space, um, it's very difficult to learn those tools to use them effectively um, if you're not an ontology expert and, do stand and use them effectively in standards. So I am very excited if you guys are going to go forward um, in, in that regard and, and hopefully have tools that perhaps are not necessarily for ontology experts to use. Um, and then the second bullet is really about the role of ontologies um, and knowledge graphs and standards development itself. So I spent many, many years in, um, in the healthcare space on clinical information exchange, exchange standards. And there were a swirl of folks around in the healthcare space looking to do ontologies, um, and develop ontologies and, and maybe not knowledge graphs at the time, I can't recall. Um, but we so wanted them to move forward and complete their work because we were left with standards where we were defining concepts and definitions using natural language, um, knowing that we think we're agreeing, but we're probably not. Um, and so I so wanted that work to, to move forward. I, I left the healthcare standard space a while ago. I'm hoping, in fact, there's good news that they have moved forward and um, but that, I think that's so key when you get into sector-specific standards. The reliance on natural language to describe concepts and, and vocabulary nomenclature, um, it's, you know, we're humans using natural language and, and it's imperfect. Um, so I, I'm very excited. I think that's, that's to me, the, the big impact to have is to be able to affect the standards in sectors and other technologies to go forward. I think that's, that's your big impact there. In terms of some NIST efforts, um, I, I did want to let you know, Rom re-emphasized the commitment to this work um, and this effort, particularly on the Ontology Summit and standards going forward. 
Um, I did do a little bit of a canvas at NIST to see what other work we had on had going on. Um, there's some work going on in um, ISO JTC1 Working Group 13 on trustworthiness, and I'll actually participate on that one, and there's some ontology work going on there. Um, NIST has a lot of work, which you probably know more than I do, um, on ontology and knowledge graph work in the manufacturing space. Um, there's the Industrial Ontology Forum. There's um, some work going on in the evaluation of ontologies. If, if you're interested in any of these, I can get you their contacts. Um, there's the vulnerability description ontology. So in our cybersecurity space, they're even recognizing that um, just using natural language definitions for concepts and things like that isn't working. They're, they're pushing into more formalism. Um, and I think you guys could help in that as well. Um, if ontology um, expertise is in the, our nice cybersecurity workforce framework as, um, as, as one of the skill sets for, for for um, some of the some of the cybersecurity positions in there, um, so those are some examples. I can I can get you contacts for those. Those um, I'm not involved in, in any of that work, um, but I think it certainly shows um, this commitment and understanding of the benefits of these, the use of them, and and so different labs that laboratories across NIST are trying to use them um, to the to the extent they can to push either for standardization or to better the standards um, in the sectors or, or technology areas that they're working on. I want to say a little bit about the business of standards. So as you all in, go forward in, in standardization, um, in, the U, in the United States, we have a bottom-up approach. We have a little bit of a capitalist model about, about standards. Um, standards development organizations, they are, they are businesses. Most of them are nonprofit, um, but they are competitive. Um, they have business models that they have to meet. Many of them either have a membership model or a document, uh, document sale model or somewhere in between. Um, they, they compete with each other. When uh, we at NIST, we sort of observe all this. And when there's a new technology area or something new and cool, you can bet you know, four or five SDOs are going to jump on board and, and start doing work in it, um, whether they should or not. Um, and then they're all motivated differently, right? So um, different SDOs have different motivations. Um, all of them that have a member model are motivated to meet the needs of their members. Um, some of them are motivated beyond that into, um, we see some SDOs going from sort of a national, US national focus into an international focus. Um, you know, none of these are bad. The motivations aren't bad. They're just really good to know and understand as you go forward. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about the commitment um, to fulfillment. So a standard gets published, you guys do your work, that's great. Um, many good standards sit on the shelf. Um, and so it's really important to think about what fulfillment looks like. What are your expectations? You have expectations um, in starting this effort and having a document. But really, what's that document going to do um, and how to get adoption? I, I think it's worth spending some time on that, especially for you folks as you develop standards that are um, how to create and develop knowledge graphs, um, what that looks like, and then how that can get translated into other standards efforts where they can make use of them, or other sectors even where they can make use of them. Um, many a good standard just sort of sat around um, because there wasn't care and feeding of that extra part. Um, this picture, which I, I reused this slide and, and realized, oh, there's the picture of the face piece. Um, this was an example of an incredibly fast standards development and adoption. Um, and it was done uh, a collaboration effort with NIST and through the NFPA, um, the Firefighters Association, who are responsible for the standards and actually conformity assessment of firefighter gear. They recognized that um, over the last, you know, I don't know how many years now, um, fires are burning hotter because we have all these new materials and their face shields, uh, firefighters are in a building for a certain length of time and they come back out. In that length of time, fires are burning hotter, their face shields are melting. And so there was a very, very quick um, effort that the expectations and the requirements were in place. The standard, got a, the standard was approved by NFPA and firefighters associations started requiring the standard so manufacturers built to it. And it was a very quick process um, to get the, the face shields out into the, into the firefighters um, so they weren't melting anymore. Um, but that was an, an ultimate example of, of a very quick process um, and a very quick 
um, it was a quick process because there was an alignment of, of expectations, requirements, the standards process, and then this, and then this adoption part. Um, so that's really important. Um, so just a couple things to think about in terms of standards. We're seeing it um, at NIST across the board, um, mostly in the IT sector. Um, there's a lot of participation changes. Maybe you, you folks that participate in standards know this. When I, um, when I started out working in standards, it was all computer scientists and engineers. Um, now it's not. It's, it's all kinds of people from um, all kinds of walks of life participating in standards development. I think that's great. Um, I think as long as you have a good balance of interest, um, let everybody be heard, I think that makes the standard better. Um, again, their standards, um, SDOs are competing for new, um, always competing in new areas of standardization. Um, we saw it with IoT, we saw it with AI, we saw it with blockchain. Um, those are sort of the recent ones, um, but that always keeps happening. Maybe knowledge graphs will become a new thing, a new hubbub, um, and, and, and there'll be a, a lot of SDOs kicking off for that. Um, the other, the other thing we're seeing certainly is products are implementing um, integrated standards. So um, back in the day, it was only IT people that showed up, and it was a standard that went into a single, um, it went into a product. Um, now we have a lot of consumer products that have a lot of connectivity to the network um, and a lot more functionality and, and data sharing. Um, and so you have um, those types of folks participating in standards and the standards development process itself has to recognize that it's living in that world with all these other standards going on. And then finally, and I don't know if it'll um, impact you all um, as you go forward, but it's the impact of the international market and regulatory environment. We're seeing on, in the international level um, a lot of push where um, there are countries, uh, nations who are recognizing that um, the rules of the SDO can be used in certain ways and, and they can get the outcomes, um, try to get outcomes that they want. I don't think they've been wildly successful. Um, and then, um, and also as a, as a regulatory environment, we're also seeing where um, there are different nations who are um, not overtly calling something a policy that they're putting into a standard, but um, it's, it's waddling and quacking like a duck as a policy. Um, and so we must be vigilant to, to make sure that, that some of these policy um, ideas don't end up in, in what should be an I, a technical standard for IT. Um, so it's not for sissies to participate in standards for those of you that do. Um, and those were some of the, um, some of the concepts. So um, I'll, I'll close here. And just to let you know, we are, we are committed to the standardization effort going forward. Um, I wish Ron were here because he could, he could speak to that more. Um, but that I think NIST has a really nice track record, has a lot of experts who are pursuing um, ontology research or, or development in, in specific sectors, cybersecurity and manufacturing being a few. And so I'm hoping that whatever comes out of your efforts, we can, um, we can bring all that expertise to bear. And I'll end there. Thank you, Lisa. That was very, very informative. So next we have Barry. Barry, you're unmuted. Still there, Barry? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear Great. me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, and so now I need to start sharing my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Good. So I'll be talking about, um, let me start from the beginning. I'll be talking about this new collection of standards, ISO IEC 2838, that's a misprint already. And um, this is a standard under the auspices of the Joint Technical Committee of ISO and the International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, Lisa mentioned that standards are all about compatibility and interoperability. This is a, an, uh, a screenshot from the homepage of the Joint Technical Committee, uh, giving some examples of what this Joint Technical Committee has brought out so far. Many, many other examples could be mentioned. And um, we have just put through a new standard so Michael Gruninger has been involved in this. I have been involved in this. It was originally 
uh, sponsored by the army, which has uh, a lot of different uses for a lot of different ontologies, and they were requiring some sort of uh, methodology or strategy for bringing about compatibility and interoperability between all of those ontologies. And so they went to ISO, and this brought forth the collection uh, that we're talking about today. And this is now uh, approved. Um, it's not yet been published, although it's ready to be published. And um, like uh, the next standard I'm going to be talking about, it's also going to be in the public domain. So you won't have to pay for this standard. You can just uh, download it uh, as many times as you like, and it's cost-free. Uh, now, the goal behind uh, part one of the standard is or was originally to formalize this idea that the way you create interoperability between ontologies is to uh, respect a hub and spokes structure, where the hub would be what is called a top level ontology, which is what part one of the standard is all about, and the spokes and the spokes uh, coming out of the spokes would be relatively more general ontologies compared to spokes at lower levels, which would be relatively more specific ontologies. So the hub would contain terms like object, process, um, event, quality, and so forth. And the spokes would contain terms like animal, cell, electron, planet, tennis ball, dollar bill, and so forth. So this, this was the idea which has been pursued by several ontology communities over the last 20 years, but not by all ontology communities. Now, the, to see what the idea involves, we'll consider a couple of examples, the pro provenance ontology and the semantic center network ontology. This is a screenshot of the upper parts of the provenance ontology. And you can see that the top level terms in this ontology are as follows. And this is a screenshot of the upper parts of the semantic sensor network ontology. And the top level terms here are quite different. Now, it's already proven that the very same people who want to use PROV to annotate their data in order to keep track of its provenance, for instance, intelligence community people, also want to use the SSN because a lot of their data is sensor data. They want to keep track of the provenance of sensor data. But you can't merge the top levels of these two ontologies because they contain a quite different repertoire of ways of describing what exists on this top level of highly general terms. And so the idea arose that we might need just one top level ontology. And this, this proposition is advanced in this paper, for instance, in 2009. I have been advancing it for 20 years. The Army uh, has been supporting this particular view for uh, at least 10 years. And that this particular view was indeed the uh, raison d'etre for ISO 21838. Now, so I think 21838 specifies the requirements of being a top level ontology. An ontology is defined here. So basically it's a collection of terms plus links connecting those terms plus definitions, with all of which is formalized. So I won't go into any more detail about this. The ontologies are made up of terms. The terms represent classes or types like animal or planet at the domain level and like object or property or process at the top level. And now we can define a category as being a very, very general class or type. That means domain neutral. So object is domain neutral because it can be applied in any domain. Spider is not domain neutral. It's very domain specific. Top level ontologies are only interested in domain neutral terms, uh, which means terms that can be used precisely to unify a lot of ontologies at lower levels in the hierarchy, domain ontologies. So then there were two requirements or two sets of requirements. 
for being a top-level ontology in accordance with 21838. One is that they should be the main neutral, and the other is that they should be maximally general, also in a second sense, namely that they cover everything. So they cover nothing in specific, but they cover everything in general. And so the problem was, how do we uh, verify that an ontology is maximally general in this sense? And the way we did this was we created a list of kinds of data. Now, ontologies are primarily use the tagging data. So as an ontology to try to uh, um, be validated as a top level ontology in the terms of the standard has to show that it can tag data pertaining to all of these different kinds of things. So it has to be able to be with space, time, change, scale, and so forth. This, this is the criterion that we adopted. The second requirement has to do with how it's presented. So we said that in order to be a top level ontology and a to the standard, you have to have textual definitions understandable by a human being. Owl axiomatization, so an equivalent set of definitions, but expressed in OWL, as, as equivalent as you can manage anyway. And then an axiomatization in common logic, which means first order logic plus the, the extra uh, pieces of equipment which common logic provides. And then we also require that there should be a proof of consistency for the common logic axiomatization and the proof of derivability of the OWL axiomatization from the common logic. And now there are three top level ontologies which are candidates in principle for um, uh, meeting these requirements. I'll mention uh, a fourth candidate uh, in a minute. Um, these are the three candidates which have already existed for some years, have users around the world, have proved themselves in battle. Uh, one is basic formal ontology, which I'm going to be talking about here primarily. The other is Dolce, and the third one is Sumo. Dolce has put itself forward to become an ISO standard top-level ontology in conformity with 21838-1. And so I'm going to, that, that will be uh, this particular, sorry, uh, th this is BFO. This has already been approved like part one. It's not yet been published, but it will be published within the next weeks. Uh, there are um, legal hurdles which have nothing to do with the content, but rather with the precise way in which the content was presented. We have overcome these legal hurdles, but ISO goes very slowly, and it, c it can only start publishing when the lawyers give the say-so. The lawyers have already approved BFO to become not just an ISO standard, but also in the public domain. And this you can already access. So this is BFO 2020. This is the version of BFO which has been accredited by ISO as conformant to 21838 part one. And the whole of the ontology is available for download at that link. And um, in, in the various different uh, formats that I, I, I mentioned. So our common logic, the proof is in the folder called model, and then the natural language version are in three forms. Can't hear you, Barry. Barry? Barry? Can you hear me now? Oh, now we can hear you. Okay, so how much did you miss? About a minute. Okay, I'll go back. Let me just try again the, the other way. Can you hear this now? Yes, we can hear that. Okay, good. So I'll go back about a minute. Um, 
So um, you, we, we, I'm assuming that we saw the requirements that you need to have the ontology available in these three forms together with proofs. And these are three major top level ontology candidates. Um, BFO, basic formal ontology, has already been approved to become ISO 21838 2. And it's in process of being published, and it will be published within the next weeks. And um, it will be available, as I said, free in the public domain. And this material, which is the content of BFO 2020, is already available, and you can download everything at that link. And this includes the common logic representation of BFO, the proofs, which are in the folder called model, and the OWL representation. And then it includes also the free text or natural language text representations in the BFO 2020 links there. Now, a second top level ontology, Dolce, has also been put forward as a candidate ontology conforming to ISO IEC 21838 part one. And, and this is in process, so this has not yet been approved. And uh, then a third approach, Topper uh, has been uh, put forward as a um, uh, 21838 4 ontology approach. And Michael Gruninger, I'm assuming, will be talking about Topper in his presentation later. Now, so we said the hub and spokes approach it underlies the way in which we envisage interoperable ontology modules being created. At the, at the moment, most ontologies are created in ad hoc ways, and so they do not link to other ontologies. And so people who need two ontologies, when they try and put the existing ontologies together to create an ontology which will be unified to meet their needs, find that it breaks. And so people are very frustrated, typically, when they try to follow the ontology method to achieve interoperability. And I saw 21838 is an answer to those frustrations. So we are better off with just one ontology on the web. Uh, now, I think that should be BFO. Uh, it may be that we end up with three. That would also be better than the current chaos. Uh, I'm going to just assume that we'd be better off with just one. And I'm going to give some uh, indication of why I think that should be BFO. So first of all, an indication having to do with knowledge graphs um, BFO is massively well used in the LOD cloud, the linked open data cloud. And there is no other ontology which is used at all. So in this paper, um, the, the authors, Armin Haller and Axel Polaris, established that uh, while BFO is used overwhelmingly for life science data, there is no evidence that either Dolce or Sumo are used anywhere. And um, as we all know, the linked open data cloud is gigantic. The, the red stuff, which is also the most well linked stuff, that, that, that's what it means when you see black down there at the bottom of the screen. This is the life science stuff. And life science was the first area to witness massive use of ontologies. It's still the area where ontologies are most systematically used. It's the area where the most scientific uses of ontologies have established themselves. And BFO is in the middle of that area. So the bioscience ontologies are built BFO, they are spokes with BFO as uh, either immediate or immediate. And so that there are ontologies now extending BFO in this way. The other 50 are in areas like engineering, which we'll discuss briefly in a minute. So there is a textbook about BFO uh, where we describe how to build ontologies using BFO. Uh, and we do this also in Chinese, in case anyone is interested. And um, we have a, a manual, uh, a paper describing tools for uh, creating Suites of ontology, so the over three using BFO. The first suite using BFO was the over three. And um, we've already seen this. 
This BFO 2020 is very similar to BFO 2.0, which was its immediate predecessor. There are two or three very minor changes in the term hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. Uh, the relational uh, content of BFO 2020 is much richer the content of the earlier version. And it's already beginning to have it since we've been for it now. Um, and there are already which are units for exploring using it, which is true of ISO 159 and it's true of STEP in the sense that we have a working group exploring how STEP can be related to BFO uh, for purposes of the IOF, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have a working group for using BFO to create a standard mid-level ontology. That's another army uh, sponsored venture. And we have working groups also with the, the uh, Joint AI Center and the DOD IC ontology working group where we're creating a DOD IC ontology suite. And then there are a number now of BFO based engineering ontologies uh, which uh, form the industrial ontologies founder, uh, which is owned by uh, people at NIST. And um, where we have a very regular meetings meet weekly, uh, developing different parts of this suite. And I'll just give you some examples of the papers which have appeared just in the last months. Uh, this is the maintenance. Technology. This is the uh, um, uh, paper on showing empirically how to interoperability between disparate engineering and ontologies by re-engineering them using BFO. Uh, this is simulation to support manufacturing based on BFO. So that's the end the, um, of the, the slide. I'll just spend a couple of minutes giving you an indication of the content of BFO 2020. Um, so I'll just use this one slide. Um, if you think about space and time, then there are various uh, different of relations you need to see that. So spatio-temporal relations are going to be related to temporal, sorry, spatio-temporal regions are going to be related to temporal regions and to spatial regions in projection relation. Uh, the projection on temporal regions is atemporal. Um, so every spatio-temporal region has a certain temporal region as its temporal extent Basta. That's always atemporally the case. But which a spatial region, a spatio-temporal region, projects onto varies from one time to the next. And so the projection relation between a spatio-temporal region and a spatial region has to all, is a ternary relation. It always has to specify the time at which it occurs. Now. Owl, as we know, so we have found a way to binaryize at relations, at in the sense of at a time. And that's why the relational repertoire of BFO 2020 is so much richer than what we had earlier. And to our knowledge, there is no other ontology which, in the owl space, knows how to deal with time in what we see as the proper way of dealing with time, uh, namely to, to binaryize the ternary XT relation. Some of which hold atemporally, some of which hold at time T. I don't need to go through these relations, but you see that we've worked pretty hard to axiomatize the relations, not just between Spatial, temporal, and temporal regions, also in processes which occur in area entities which are located in spatial regions, at times material entities move around, and material entities which are located in sites, for instance, a rabbit in a rabbit hole, and so forth. So we have what we think is a very rich spatio-temporal relation architecture, and we think we have a rich um, 
architecture for dealing with other kinds of things also. And, uh, so you, and you're all welcome to explore at the links that I provided earlier. So that's the end. Thank you, thank you, Barry. Um, so next we have Michael Grinninger. Just a moment, I have to, there we go. So Michael, can you unmute? Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and uh, see my screen? Okay, um, all right, so uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, say a few words today. Um, I'm actually not going to be talking about uh, ISO 23 uh, directly. Um, these are maybe some more big picture sorts of comments, uh, maybe generate a bit of controversy. Um, Okay, so I just want to kind of start off with a challenge. I mean, our goal as kind of an applied ontology community is the design and deployment of shareable and reusable ontologies. I mean, that's kind of been the goal uh, ever since its inception. And uh, the question has always been, how do we support that, right? And how do we actually develop ontologies that are shareable among different, different groups, different people, different software applications? And how do we design ontologies that are reusable? So that what somebody builds ontology today can be reused, potentially extended uh, by someone else tomorrow. And so in the context of what we're looking at uh, in, in uh, today's session would be the question of, well, how do ontologies support this shareability and reusability? And perhaps maybe also a little question, um, is it possible for standards to actually inhibit shareability and reusability? And if this is so, how can we avoid that problem? And I just want to kind of start off here, just going way back uh, to the 90s. There was um, at the European AI conference back in 1994 in Amsterdam, there was a workshop on up implemented ontologies. And um, in a way, it kind of had, it had a really good premise. I mean, the idea was that all the papers that were there had to be accompanied with an explicit encoding of the ontology in an ontology representation language. So the idea was to kind of uh, prevent a vaporware ontologies or ontologies that, that maybe look good in, in a discussion in natural language, but when you actually said, well, hey, wait a sec, how are these being used? It sort of involved a lot of hand waving. So, so this was a really good place to start. Unfortunately, we never, I mean, over the years, we didn't kind of continue this discipline. Um, but regardless, I mean, the. What was interesting was that every single ontology was, was encoded in a different ontology representation system formalism. Um, but, you know, this kind of led, uh, you know, like a, a, to, to, a, to a great extent, this kind of led to um, the development of KIF, the knowledge interchange format, which evolved into common logic, which is an ISO standard I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, but I think in retrospect, the problem was not so much the diversity of the ontology representat representation languages per se. It was more that uh, there was a lot of these different notations had a kind of a lack of a formal semantics. And to that extent, the problem was that, again, not, not the diversity, the problem was that the ontologies themselves could not really be evaluated, you know, say with respect to consistency, correctness, completeness, uh, and they couldn't even be compared. I mean, that was kind of the real problem that, that sort of came out of that. And so I would kind of argue then that the standards that are relevant to ontologies are the ones which enable this evaluation and this comparison. And so, for example, uh, to come up with standard representation languages with formal semantics, and I think we've, as a community, we've pretty well achieved this. I mean, we, in, the, in the kind of the first order logic sphere, we have common logic, uh, which is ISO 24707. Um, on the web, in the web community, we have OWL, argue RDF as well. And so, so again, these are our ontology representation languages that, um, that have a formal semantics. You can argue about what's, what, what expressiveness is needed for particular ontologies, but I mean, this, this problem is you know, basically done. And, and, and standardizing at this level, I mean, again, is, is, is important because of this, this ability to specify the formal semantics. 
because it's with formal semantics that you can formally say, what does it mean for an ontology to be consistent? What does it mean for one ontology to be able to uh, entail another ontology? Um, what are the possible models of an ontology? Are there unintended ones? Are there omitted ones? Things like that. Another um, standard that's kind of recently come out of OMG is the uh, DOL, the Distributed Ontology Language. And I kind of mentioned this because what this also does is this provides ways of formally specifying mappings both between, uh, between ontologies and, um, and also between the logics, between the different um, ontology representation languages that people um, you know, kind of specify. So again, like coming back to this idea of, of how do we enable um, comparison? And this is a way of formally specifying these mappings. And then finally, there's this idea of, of coming up with standardized axiomatizations of ontologies. And here I would, you know, again, just kind of maybe draw a little sharper line here. Um, again, the, 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 the raison d'etre of 21838 was not necessarily to standardize a single ontology, but it was more to provide standardized, standard axiomatizations of these ontologies that conform to the criteria of what a, a top level ontology, um, what constitutes a top level ontology. So the problem can be where you have uh, ontologies, you know, that are being developed. Um, they, as, as they're being developed, they're, they're, it's very dynamic. Axioms are changing. Um, people, when they write a particular research paper, will have this set of axioms, and later on might change it in between. And so, in, in a lot of ontologies, there's not a kind of a um, a explicit management of versioning um, of that ontology. And so really when I'm talking about st uh, standard ontologies, what I'm, I'm really getting at are kind of standardized axiomatizations that, you know, this is, if you, I want to know what are the axioms of a particular ontology, I know exactly where to go, uh, where to find those axioms, that there are, are kind of uh, quality criteria that have been exercised upon that to, to guarantee that the, that ontology is consistent, that it, it's been proven to be consistent. Uh, and things like that. And then there are different versions are around that it is clear what the relationships between these different versions are. Uh, and, and, and so I get another example of a standardized axiomatization ontology is say PSL, the process specification language, ISO 18629. And now I would say that the pro maybe like the downside of, of standards is not so much maybe the, uh, the standards that develop within a, a you know, kind of an organization or more um, set of practices like in, within ISO, the problem often is with de facto standards, um, where an ontology gets uh, developed, you know, possibly by people who are, are kind of getting together in a kind of a pseudo standards sort of way. Um, but the problem being that uh, the ontologies get adopted without sufficient evaluation and analysis. The risk of this is that people use ontologies that contain um, ontological errors, that contain, uh, that, that have unintended models, uh, perhaps omit models that should be um, possible, or that uh, incorporate implicit ontological commitments that prevent reuse. I don't really wanna name names here, that, that, that might get into too much controversy, but you find a lot of these on the web. And the, the thing is that at a certain point, a a kind of an inertia develops that well, okay, look, we've we came up with this. We argued, oh, and, and this is the group that on you know that's kind of constructing the, the this ontology. They say, okay, we worked a lot on on coming up with this. This was the discussion that came out, the consensus that came out, and uh, it's too late. You know, it's out there. Um, we're not going to fix anything, even if there are problems. Um, often there's this kind of overemphasis on pseudo pragmatics. Oh, you know, it's good enough for what I'm doing. Don't waste my time with your fancy ass theory. Um, I don't need any ontological analysis. You know, it's, we're deploying it. A little semantics goes a long way, so don't bother me anymore. The, and I would kind of argue that uh, the problem here is that these ontologies are not really being designed or evaluated with respect to any notion of semantic requirements. And it's not clear what criteria are being used to adopt this particular ontology beyond popularity contests. That there's a certain, again, an inertia that if enough people use it, then um, it, it can't really be criticized anymore. It's uh, too big to fail. So I would kind of argue that, I mean, what we maybe need to do, so what, what kind of practices can we, can we kind of use here to uh, kind of address like what makes a standard ontology? I would argue that the kind of the consensus driven practice of current standards development process is, is, is needed, it's necessary. 
but it's only the first step. Uh, and what very often happens is people believe that once they have this kind of consensus, then they're done. And the idea is that, well, first of all, what's the outcome of this consensus, right? It should not be um, a, uh, definitely should not be natural language, right? That we cannot stop there. And I think a lot of people recognize that natural language specifications alone for a standard, particularly ontology-based standard, is, is, is insufficient. But another problem that people do is they jump right from that consensus right to a set of axioms. And what this, what this jump does is that it, it, it kind of, it, it avoids, it sidesteps, um, all this analysis that I was talking about at the beginning, right? The, that we want to be able to evaluate ontologies um, with respect to their logical properties, but also their ontological properties, like the, 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 the relationship between the ontology and their, these, these requirements. So the outcome of, of consensus, I would argue, that should be the set of semantic requirements. Uh, and these semantic requirements are then subjected to ontological analysis. Uh, then once you have these requirements that have kind of survived the analysis, then you, then you write the axioms and you, eva you evaluate the axioms against those semantic requirements. So to use the, the kind of metaphor from software engineering where you have verification and validation, verification is saying, uh, is, this the, is this ontology correct with respect to the requirements? Ontology validation is saying, is, are these the right requirements for this domain? So in other words, am I building the right ontology for a particular domain? And you can kind of see the, the, the distinction here, right? So I could have a bad set of requirements, um, right? But I could have, a, I have an ontology that's, that's kind of correct with respect to those requirements, has the right axioms, but those requirements are, are, have problems in them. There are, you know, again, kind of uh, ontological kind of problems with those. Uh, and so you end up having a, a nice uh, formalization, but it's uh, kind of being irrelevant. It, it, it's irrelevant. So there, the validation and verification are both required here. Um, just as, a, a, as an end slide, because I just want to have a few slides so we could kind of uh, go for more discussion. I also just kind of want to raise that within the uh, IAOA, the uh, International Association of Ontology and Applications. There's a new uh, technical committee, the Industry and Standards Technical Committee. And this committee has two purposes. Um, one is to foster the use of applied ontology and standardization initi initiatives. So that's very much what we're talking about today. Um, it's also trying to facilitate interactions across people in industry and applied ontology research. So uh, there's a sort of dissemination activity that's involved here. But there's also a, a kind of a, a need to kind of identify uh, what all the different standardization efforts are and to hopefully provide uh, to some extent some kind of um, uh, support to coordination, facilitate coordination among all of these, um, but also to uh, kind of apply some of these ideas I was just talking about um, before, how to, how we can, um, uh, you know, the ontology community can support the, the uh, standards community by, by applying ontological analysis by identifying um, potential problems within a conceptualization, uh, you know, these kind of informal, requ the, the semantic requirements, um, and then also to, to leverage the expertise in actually axiomatizing what those are, um, and also to, you know, to uh, support this, the ability to also compare ontologies. Once you have this formal analysis, you can actually compare ontologies, um, do ontology mappings, et cetera. So I thought I'd just kind of leave it there, and then can, we can kind of, uh, uh, start the discussion round. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we have a number of questions on the chat room. Let's see. First questions were from Ravi. So let me uh, see if I can unmute Ravi. Go ahead, Ravi. Ravi, you should be able to unmute yourself. Well, until that comes through, let's, let me just ask a few of his questions. Um, this is for Lisa. A small set of representatives, 
from is adoption driven by an industry need or by an agency? Okay. I suspect Robbie was having the same problem with the unmuting. So, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was rapidly trying to unmute because I knew there was this question. Um, so is it the question, um, is, it, is adoption driven by industry need or agency need? Yeah. Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, certainly, um, there are examples, and, and we think the better example is that adoption is driven by industry, right? That there are, there are industry drivers, the market wants it, right? Um, that's, that's, that's the better optimum situation. Um, however, there are, can be agency drivers. I think, um, I don't think Barry spoke about um, in some of the DOD effort and some of the, in some of their efforts as, as a driver for some of this work to go forward, um, and and so we see it as a sort of a scale. There's the um, industry adoption, market driven approach on one end, and at the other end would be regulation, which I don't think is applicable in any way here. And and then there's sort of somewhere in between, right? Um, I'm fascinated by this discussion of um, of um, the the drivers that have been presented so far and that um, there's variation in, I think I saw on the one slide, you know, maybe this is more of a popularity contest. Um, I'm not, uh, maybe that there's an opportunity there to, to drill down and provide some better criteria and considerations for choosing um, which standard or which tool gets used. Okay. Um, Robbie also had a question for Barry. And just a moment, I'll try to. Barry? You're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, you're starting to come through, but you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, so, I uh, do I need to go to the, the the other place in order to see the question, or can someone read it to me? Sure, I'll read it to you. I found the other place. Uh, which question is it? Hello? Yeah, you're you're dropping out. Do you have another microphone? Um, is this better? Yes. Sounds better. So can you read the question? I can't see where it is. Uh, yeah, this question about hub and spoke. If the hub includes, we have to include basic entities and relations. Yeah. Uh, what gets represented in the spokes? Yeah, I'm curious so about that too. I mean, where would uh, PROV sit in the hub and spoke system, for example? So the spokes are typically generated by a simple specialization. So you start with object. A rabbit is a kind of object. So the rabbit ontology would uh, be part of a spoke which, which includes uh, other names of mammals, for instance. Um, and that kind of specialization can go a long way. For instance, uh, if we start with a disease ontology, then we can create an infectious disease ontology just by focusing on the specific properties of infectious disease. And that would be a spoke coming out of the disease ontology. And then we can create a, a virus infectious disease ontology, which would extend the infectious disease ontology by containing just those terms which relate to viral infectious diseases. 
And then we can create a coronavirus infectious disease ontology, which contains those terms which relate just to coronaviruses. And then we can create, which we already did, a COVID-19 infectious disease ontology, which relates, which extends the coronavirus ontology in, in, in containing just terms that refer specifically to COVID-19. Um, and so it's really very simple to move from a top level ontology to a domain ontology. Uh, but that just gives you what you can think of as the terminological backbone of the domain ontology. You still need to work out all the relations between the uh, terms in the ontology. And that is not a trivial thing. That involves uh, a lot more work. The top level ontology gives you, or anyway, DMO and Dolce give you a certain repertoire of relations, but you're going to need to add more relations typically than the ones in the top level repertoire. Well, no, but what about provenance ontology? Is that uh, a top level? So or there is domain? already a, an effort, again, a, it's a DOD effort to re-engineer the provenance ontology uh, as a BFO-based ontology, or at least to create a variant version of the provenance ontology, which would be BFO conformant. Now, how do you define the terms in the provenance ontology? Well. Uh, provenance includes things like um, events of documentation, for instance, and we have a term process which events of documentation would be children of. And so that would be one place where we would start. I would need to look at the provenance ontology again to tell you where we would start with the other places. Uh, there is also an effort underway to re-engineer the sem semantic sensor network ontology so it's already been re-engineered so that it's no longer the case that it's only Dolce, which is the top level. There are alternative registers of the semantic sensor network using alternative top level. And BFO will be added to that list. Okay. Uh, and then with, with regard to the specific question, a sensor is an object in BFO terms, namely an object whose function is to measure certain signals and uh, and so you start with object and then you define a sensor as an object whose function is x y z and then you already have the beginnings of your sensor ontology great that's and and i have a quick remark to michael if, if i may um so he said that the um iso 21838 effort uh did not start uh with the goal of uh creating one top level ontology um, that was, in fact, the goal. So Michael joined uh, some months after the committee had already met multiple times, and partly as a result of his joining. So we, we are very grateful for his contributions. We did move the uh, scope of the standard so that it would include more than just BFO. But the original Army sponsor request was that BFO sub should be subject to validation as an ISO standard. Okay, so uh, Todd has his hand up. Hello. Um, this is a question for Michael and others on the call. Um, first, let me point out one aspect I think both Barry and Michael referred to or alluded to was the issue of analysis. And that is a problem because A, a lot of people don't understand what it might mean to have ontological analysis applied. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, there is no coherent framework for ontological analysis. So my question specifically for Michael, you mentioned semantic requirements. What might those be? Michael? Just a second, he might be muted. Okay, there I am. Um, so semantic requirements would would be um, kind of the the bridge between informal and formal. So where, very often people might express those in terms of competency questions, mm -hmm. or they may express those uh, requirements in terms of uh, kind of to get moving towards uh, kind of the formal semantics, the kind of mathematical structures. 
so for example, you know, if you're talking about time, I just put something into the chat. You know, like say if you're looking at time, you're asking like what are the you know possible ontological commitments related to a time ontology? You know, I could have time points, I could have time intervals, I could have a combination of the two. And so then when I'm starting to talk about require semantic requirements, I might start talking about, well, you know, if we make a commitment towards say time points, then you know, what are the requirements that I would need to have? Well, when I might want time to be you know linearly ordered, um, you know, and things like that. So uh, whether you're going to go the approach of explicitly specifying these kind of logical criteria or whether you express them in terms of, of competency questions. So in other words, you, you know, I want my, an ontology that is sufficient to be able to represent um, a particular set of use case motivating scenario and then be able to provide what I would, you know, what the designer would consider to be the correct answers to that. And so that's kind of an implicit way of specifying what these uh, semantic requirements are. It well, identifies what's the signature, what relations and classes I need to have, and then it gets used to evaluate, well, when do I have enough axioms? And certainly the notion of competency questions suggests some semantic requirements, but are you saying that uh, those competency questions need further analysis or uh, derivation thereof or therefrom? Well, so, I mean, the, the, the idea would be that you initially start off with with uh, sort of a natural language spec of, of competency questions, and then as you start designing, you know, identifying what your your logical signature is, and as soon as you start providing some axioms, then you can you can translate, you can formalize that natural language statement into a, a logical statement, and then at that point you can use reasoners to determine whether or not the the ontology, the axioms of the ontology you provide, are actually sufficient for answering that kind of a question. Okay, well, that you point out one serious or significant weakness in the whole process of developing ontologies. We are going to use natural languages to communicate until we find some better mechanism. Mm -hmm. And when those natural language definitions are put forward, I have found regularly that there is little or no analysis of those definitions. Mm -hmm. And even in the context of you have a use case or you have some other additional requirements that put constraints on the possible interpretations, there is still lacking uh, an appropriate analysis of those natural language definitions. And mm -hmm. there, the lack of that analysis entails all sorts of problems later on. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Want to okay. come back to the IOF? <laughs> now I'm able to see the Zoom again after a long time. So were your questions answered, Ravi? No, I was not able to hear the audio because Zoom was not working. Oh. Hello? Yeah, well, I read your questions and I believe we have them answered. Uh, you so you can listen to the recording later. Okay. Uh, one, one that I had in particular was on standards for semantics as well as standards for inter integrating or checking and verifying that two ways of representing same ontology, same domain ontology are the same ontologies. Namely, there is a standard by which we can measure both. Yeah, I could maybe feel that. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so first of all, I mean, when you talk about standards for semantics, in, in a way that's what uh, the specifications of OWL do, the specification of common logic do. In both of those cases, there are uh, different syntaxes that are allowed, right? So for OWL, you can have the Manchester syntax, you can have the uh, you know, functional syntax, turtle syntax. Of course, the standard itself, say, is represented in, in um, XML, right? But, but there are different human readable syntaxes for it. Uh, they all share the same semantics. The same thing with, with uh, common logic. And then, um, so that's, that, that's, that's what the standards are for standardizing semantics. Now, the other the interesting thing, though, and this actually comes up, um, say, with, with uh, top-level ontologies, 21838, is suppose I have a, you know, a common logic axiomatization of a particular ontology, but I also have a, an OWL version of it. Um, how are those two related, right? And 
I mean, in a lot of cases, that, that's kind of a, uh, a difficult question. Um, I mean, you want the owl axioms to be logically deducible from the first order ones, but but just even saying that, right, it means you have to somehow do a mapping from, you know, uh, a, a kind of a description logic semantics to a first order semantics. And, and to, to a great extent, that's what Dole does, the distributed ontology language uh, that, that's come out of OMG. So that kind of allows you to say, you know, and in a very, very rigorous way invoking category theory, you know, Tom Osakovsky is the expert there, um, you know, to show how you would coherently say that this set of owl, this owl version of an ontology is uh, deducible from this first order axiomatization of the ontology, to what extent it is the same. Actually, that is the purpose of ODM, and it's been working very hard, and even uh, up to UML2, I think, it has translated owl into UML. Well, but then uh, uh, it's usually the, the other way around. I mean, uh, the, the question of what are the semantics of UML are often, well, that's a whole other question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's a whole other meeting. Yes, related to mock. Right. So what the, I'm, I won't take too long, but just one question. Are we at a standard of ontologies today? How far are we from that? So that we can compare two different ways of re representing an ontology to be the same. Check whether it is the same or different. Mm -hmm. And how similar are the two ontologies? And what are the differences? Essentially, do I, V, and V. Mm -hmm. Well, so if if the on, ontologies um, have axiomatizations, you can you, you we can already do that that comparison logically. I think a deeper issue that you've raised, I think uh, in the chat, I think Corey raised it, uh, Mike Bennett raised it, um, is the kind of a, this other notion of when would two ontologies be in some sense logically in or sort of ontologically incompatible. So this is sort of prior to their axioms, right? So if I, again, if I have axioms, I have, even with time, if I have an ontology that has uh, time intervals, I have an ontology that has um, time points and time intervals, you can already talk about how those are related. There's been a lot of work on, on something like that. Uh, but I think it's kind of what's deeper is where we don't yet kind of maybe understand what all the possible choices are. And so there's a sense in which you can have an ontology that's sort of incompatible with other ontologies because it, it, it takes to a totally different sort of, of commitment. And it's not clear, well, is that commitment right or wrong? And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna raise one example. Like I'm, I'm not denigrating the, the ontology in any way. I'm just using this as an example. But there's this ontology called GIST, G-I-S-T. Um, it's kind of uh, been used by the company Semantic Arts. Um, and within GIST, they make this commitment that um, uh, events slash processes, I can't remember exactly the name they use for this class, um, is a subclass of time interval, right? Now, this is very different from any other ontology we talked about today um, in which, which time intervals and, and events are distinct. I mean, you can talk about an event that somehow occurs over time intervals, you know, uh, occupies a time interval, but there's, they're, 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 they're actually disjoint classes. Events and intervals are disjoint classes, and there's a relation between them. Whereas GIST makes this commitment to say, well, no, events are subclasses of, of time intervals. Now, that's a very, to me, it's a very strange kind of commitment, but, you know, I don't know, it, there's a sense in which that's right or wrong, but the fact that it's made, that commitment is made, has consequences on how compatible it is with other ontologies. And again, I thought this was sort of um, um, uh, kind of unusual, but when it comes to actually location, there is this philosophical position called supersubstantivalism, uh, which, which claims that, that material objects and spatial regions are also not distinct, that, that a spatial, or not material object is just a subclass of a spatial region where something is. Uh, and there are arguments that philosophers argue for and against that. Um, so it's, it's a possible commitment, but again, I would find it unusual. Uh, but, you know, that's just one case, and I think we need to do a better job of understanding in different conceptualizations, what are the possibilities, and, and this is the analysis that, that uh, Todd was alluding to, I think, that to really kind of understand, like, what are these commitments that are at a very deep level incompatible um, versus other 
choices that might not be, say, incompatible, like time points versus time intervals, I can come up with an ontology that incorporates both. And so in a sense, there's not, they're not incompatible, but it's not trivially you know, compatible. Can I ask okay, uh, let's see. Barry? Barry, did you have anything that you wanted to add? No, no. But, yeah. but I. Well, actually, yes, one small point on Todd's original question uh, how do we analyze the natural language? I would say that that's what uh, building ontologies with OWL and common logic is doing. The, we analyze the natural language and work by working out what the best way of representing the content of the natural language assertion or definition is using uh, a logical language. No. <laughs> yes. Did we, did, okay. we resolve, did we resolve whether a top level ontology needs to have some kind of domain entities embedded in them for those domains where we want to have a hub and spoke relationship? If not... Well, embedded is the wrong word, I believe. So the, the spokes are not embedded in the hub. The spokes extend the hub. So there has to be a hook that has something common to connect the two. It, it is our relation. It, it will do the job mostly so a rabbit is a kind of object. So rabbit is connected to the top level term object by the is a relation. It's not rocket science. Well. <laughs> okay, let, let's, let's move on. We don't have that much more time. Uh, okay. Mike Bennett, you have a question? Can you oh. I'm, I'm not next in the queue, so uh, I think I see oh, I'm, Corey ahead of me. Actually, I'm going by the order in which people asked questions, not by the order of hands up. Oh, okay. Well, mine, yes, you've seen it in the chat. Um, so, uh, Barry, you mentioned in one of your slides about top level ontology being for data about things. And um, I'm increasingly concerned that there's this sort of distinction between ontologies of things, you know, what does it mean to be a bond or a legal person or a bank or something in terms of the, the truth makers such as uh, language acts and so on that make it that thing versus the data about that thing and how we deal with digital twins and data surrogates and so on, you know, the difference between, say, uh, a measurement from a measuring device and a vessel that it's measuring some uh, uh, property of. So I was just a little bit surprised about that. I just want to take that in a couple of quick directions. So one is that if we're looking at data, then that seems to rule out the, the, the realist approach, which you didn't mention specifically here, but there can be data about falsehoods, lies, mistakes, uh, different characterizations, as Michael mentioned earlier in his response to Corey on different uh, uh, ways of conceptualizing time. So data really does require that kind of Kantian approach of axiomatizing the conceptualization of something in the world. So I was a little bit surprised how you uh, reconcile that with the, the more realist approach of, of BFO. Yes, yeah, so first of all, with BFO does not have a very rich uh, ontology or uh, rich treatment of information artifacts such as data and databases, uh, but we have an extension ontology called the information artifact ontology, which deals with those kinds of questions in great detail. And uh, the hook from BFO to the information artifact ontology is um, the term generically dependent continuant. That sounds very difficult, but roughly it means pattern. Um, a, a copyable pattern. Every symbol, every piece of data is a copyable pattern which can recur over and over again. And uh, so we, ha we have this heading, generically dependent continuum. We also have a relation of aboutness. And as you say, not all information artifacts are about real things. And we solve this problem by it means it's something called the modal relation ontology. 
The modal relation ontology is a topic unto itself, but roughly speaking, it means that we can assert that datum D is about um, Mike Bennett, and then we have a real relation. Or we can assert datum D prime is about Mike Bennett's 13th daughter. And then we have not a genuine aboutness relation, but rather a modal aboutness relation. And the feature of the modal aboutness relation is that there is no entity on the right hand side. The assertion can still be formulated. We can still have the assertion in our database, but we don't, we can't draw the conclusion from that assertion that Michael Bennett had a 13th daughter. And so you, you, the, the modal relation ontology is the way we deal with your problem. Everything is realist. The datum is real. The aboutness is real. It's just not about anything real. And so we don't have anything in the ontology to refer to that uh, anything because there is no such anything because you never had 13 daughters. I'm guessing now, but I assume you never had 13 daughters. <laughs> you assume correctly, <laughs> to my knowledge at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. Smith. Barry, did you have your hand up? Uh, no, that was from previous, uh, a previous round. Okay. And um, Corey, are you still around? I am still around. Oh, great. So this has been discussed somewhat in, in, in terms of the, the level of commitments in the, in the various uh, proposals for upper ontologies. But, uh, and I suspect many of us have found we tried to use them, uh, commitments that uh, seem incompatible with what we were trying to, uh, to, to represent. And kind of accepting that that is going to be a problem, that um, ontologists are, are going to want to be precise and are going to want to axiomatize things very precisely, but in doing so may create these, these commitments. Uh, is there a way that we can approach this problem to layer it or, or uh, in some way separate the concerns so that those commitments uh, can be somewhat separated um, from maybe the, the fundamental concepts uh, so that we can have the, the hub without um, buying into uh, the specific worldviews. And I address this to any of the presenters. Well, I, I, I just make, make a, a small comment. I, I, I think there's a distinction, and I'm still grappling with it, um, between, I say, the kind of fundamental ontological commitments that, that get made that, that can have a sort of, that can be, you know, fundamentally incompatible um, versus ones that might be a little more superficial. Uh, so for example, and I'm not talking about say upper ontologies or whatever, just like this toy example that's come up, that came up a lot. I think maybe Pat Hayes was the original one that proposed it, but um, you know, so suppose if I have a domain where I have objects and, and colors, I'm describing how, you know, what color objects are. And so I can have one conceptualization that leads to an ontology where um, I have uh, objects and I have the, the colors represented as classes. So I have red things, blue things, green things. Uh, there's another approach that somebody else took that said, oh no, I have um, um, colors, are, there's a class called color and there are three instances, red, green, and blue. And I have this uh, functional relation or you know, relation that says, you know, has color. So I can say object one has color red, object two has color green. Now, you know, there's a sense in which, um, you know, these really are, uh, you know, they're talking about the same thing. I mean, the logically, they have very different commitments. I mean, right, like but in one case, the uh, colors are, are real things, whereas in others, the colors are classes. And this, come, this comes up in a lot of different places. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about like financial work, you know, is a loan a thing or is a loan or a class that's sort of a relation between other things, like the, the borrower and the lender and the amount, or is a loan one thing? So uh, there's this idea of reification that, that kind of comes up and it's not clear whether that's kind of a, a fundamental deep ontological um, conflict 
or whether you can just kind of represent these two by just being a kind of a reification of the other, or, or um, you know, that seems to be the case in, in, in that particular example. I think there are a lot of cases where one ontology does have relations, whereas the other ontology sort of reifies the relation. And the question, yeah, is that, is that something that's insurmountable, or is that just something that, because it's left implicit, causes problems? So can I well, say something? In our example of, of uh, uh, enterprise knowledge graphs, where you may not be able to apply deep logic, uh, it's certainly more of a issue than uh, environments where you can can apply uh, deep reasoning to uh, to make those connections. Harry. Uh, yes, so um, I wanted to make a comment on the loan question. So there, there is a, a, a common tendency among philosophers to assume that if you uh, 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 start talking about loans, um, then and, and you start talking in a realist way as if loans really existed, then you're making some kind of mistake. Uh, because surely we can just cash out whatever we want to say about loans by talking about relations between people and amounts of money. The problem is that loans can be collateralized and they can be divided and sold and gifted and, and service collateral and, and so forth. And as soon as you start uh, adding several of those functors to a loan, you end up with something which is far remote from the original relation between two people and an amount of money. So the entire financial services industry would be in a bad way if it couldn't quantify over loans. I would think. Right. And that's kind of a good example, I say, of, of you know, earlier people are talking about, like, what do you mean by ontological analysis? And it's, this, it's this, 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 this analysis of saying, you know, what are the possible choices here? What are the, you know, fundamentally, what is an ontology? What are the things in this domain? And then coming up with arguments um, for, you know, what these different choices are and what are the incompatible um, choices? And when are things just two so different I, ways of I doing would the same say, thing? I would say actually that is the fundamental um, issue that we have to face and, and we can eat, this is a bullet. We all have to bite one way or another. So I say there are equally good ways of representing reality. And, um, and, and so I might, as a, a former philosopher, I might say, well, let's work out philosophically which one is right. But I don't believe that one or another is right. Uh, because I think we can cut the cheese in different ways and still be right. But I still think that BFO is the one ontology that we should all embrace. And the reason is that we get so many benefits if we all have the same top level ontology. All the problems of interoperability go away. Or anyway, all of the problems of interoperability associated with the use of general terms at the top go away. So for me, it's a pragmatic choice. Uh, we have to we have to bite the bullet, choose one ontology, and then make sure it's uh, kept maintained in good order and improved over time. Because if we continue arguing all the time about which ontology is best, then we will just make fools of ourselves. Okay, um, we've actually run out of time. We're five minutes over. Um, we just have one more person with his hand up. How quick would your comment be, Doug? Still there? Mine? Yeah. Uh, my my question comment is is, you know, we need some sort of integrated development environment. Like if I was to embrace BFO in something, I'd like to be able to put, you know, kind of load BFO into something, something other than pro the new protege, and then be able to set some, set up some axioms, maybe some test queries on, you know, actually letting me see it in use in my domain where I, and, and so what, what kind of tools do we have and uh, what are we going to do to get the tools that we need to be able to finally embrace ontology because there's an inference engine willing to back it up for us. Uh, okay. That's my question. So, how mature That's is the, the industry at this point? Barry? 
Yeah, I was just going to say that's another $64,000 question. Um, so one of the, uh, the benefits of the interest by DOD and other sources in this kind of work is that we can hope to get support for trying to resolve those kinds of questions, tooling questions. And I, I'm, I'm already uh, working with various people who are in, in the um, position to address those questions. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, but then I'm always optimistic. Michael? Well, if it's only $64,000 question, that's where he says, I can start a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, <laughs> but, but no, I... I, I, I plus if you want to go ahead and put $64,000 <laughs> towards it, then we're, then we're set, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the... Um, that I think, I think Barry is kind of an like, like important you know, kind of issue there that it's... And what I kind of got out of his comment was, you know, it, it's it's not so much like what's the best environment for writing axioms or, or browsing. I mean, I, I, I agree that's, that's, it's important, but I think what we need is a lot of more kind of support for that, that bridge between the, the, or like as Todd was kind of alluding to the, the bridge between the, the natural language and the, and the axioms. Um, right. Like, you know, Barry said, that is what we are doing when we're building an ontology is that, is that bridge. And I think that's where the, we, the tooling would actually have the most impact. Uh, I mean, you know, Emacs is a great environment for writing axioms, um, you know, and, and uh, if you want to have an integrated environment, it's not really that much that difficult to do it, as, but it's not going to solve the problems that we're talking about today. I, I guess that's true. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of mapping problems that we still have to solve once yeah. we get in the conundrum of trying to put them into a tool. Those yeah. aren't. Yeah. True. Okay. So I think we better adjourn. Um, this is actually the last regular session of the summit this year. The, uh, we'll be meeting again next week, same time, for the what will be the third synthesis session. And then we're going to have a series of sessions uh, where we try to put together the communique. So I would definitely invite anybody who is interested in being involved in trying to collect and summarize all of the information that we have um, seen in the uh, series of ontology summit sessions this year to come next week and uh, hope to see you then.